Like that so was. So, h- how much money did you have in the bank? We had, at that point, uh, less. It was thousand bucks. Maybe, oh maybe God. scraped together. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Yeah, you know, I I, uh, I tell again lesson learned, right? Like I look back and when you get that mortgage pre-approval, uh-huh. <laughs> like that's the bank saying, "Hey, we're we're willing to lend you this," you yeah. know, because because yeah, really take a look at that number, yeah, and really understand, like, if I'm doing that, like, what do I have left to eat? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Welcome to Business Blind Spots Podcast, where we learn about successful people and their journey towards success and the mistakes and road bumps that they experience along the way. Today's guest is Bazon Morris. He is a financial advisor out of the Volition Advisory Group through Raymond James. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You ready for the big day? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I asked how you've been doing lately, because I know you are... On the board of the Cat Town Weir, yeah, uh, nonprofit here in Fort Worth, and the big gala is coming up. It is. Um, can you can you talk about the gala? Yeah, yeah, pretty excited about it. So, um, yeah, every year it's a big black tie fundraiser uh, up on the top floor of the Fort Worth Club. We take over the whole floor and just have a great time. Um, the organization itself has been around, uh, you know, going on its eleventh year now, and you know, raised millions of dollars for for veterans. And um, one of the they're, they're Big reasons I got involved in it. One, a hundred percent of donated dollars go back towards veterans and helping veterans. So, you know, if somebody is even if they're submitting a payment through PayPal, we cover as the board, we cover that cost. So just being able to to, to look at someone and go, if you give a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars goes towards a veteran, like that's super powerful. And um the other was uh, back in I guess it was twenty nineteen, I think uh General Dunsford was the speaker and he was the commandant at the time and i was like i looked at a picture chairman chairman oh was he chair he was chairman that's right you're right and um i was like i looked on online a couple days later and i had reached out to another board member who shall remain nameless and didn't respond to me but then i saw this picture and i looked and i was like i gotta get involved with this like how did these guys get get the chairman to come down to fort worth Mm. in february like it just didn't make sense so you know Got on the board a couple of years ago and been wrangled in and suckered to do more every year. <laughs> You're doing an amazing job. Oh, I appreciate amazing it. Amazing job. <laughs> Dunsford was probably one of my favorite guests. Neller, Neller's speech was fantastic. Is that right? Because um, we had the year before that, Neller was uh, actually acting commandant. Okay. And he showed up and he had all his Secret Service people with him and advanced party and it was, it was pretty cool. So. Yeah, I'm um, awesome. very excited to have you on here because I know your story is inspiring to me. Kind of your your journey towards success, what you had to overcome post military, um, and I also like really uh, conversations that you and I have had about self mastery and some of the things that you've really purposely tackled um, about yourself. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it'll, if it'll help, I'll give kind of my like professional track, right? Like so. Allow me to knock my ring. I was a Naval Academy grad, right? Here we go. <laughs> I'm, surprised I'm surprised you didn't wear your shirt. I'm surprised it took like three minutes in and you haven't mentioned it. Like, <laughs> well, you know, uh, I have some future Naval Academy guests that I want on here, so All right. <laughs> you know, I got to play nicely. Don't uh, talk too badly about yeah. Canoe you just yet. <laughs> just yet, but it's coming. Don't worry. Uh, so I graduated. I took my commission in the Marine Corps. Uh, I was an artillery officer. Um, had a couple tours in Iraq, was there in 03 for the invasion. Mm. Um, in 04, I was assigned to a strike group staff and went back. Um, little time in country, but then actually spent a lot of time out on the Arabian Gulf mm. doing uh, doing operations out there, which was really interesting. Um, just kind of seeing seeing things operate at that level. I got to spend a night out on an oil rig. or It was an exercise that we did. We didn't end up spending the night, but we were out there all day. And literally, like, you're standing there, and it's like, oh, look. There's Iran. Like, 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 that's the that's interesting. Like, yeah. you know, like, well, at least you're not around there today. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, so it's really cool that, um, you know, whenever we met after a couple of conversations, we realized that your, was it a gun group? My, gun my battery. Yeah. Your battery was 
specifically responsible for saving my butt. Uh, <laughs> one of many. One of we, many. We were <laughs> in, in, in some some stuff, and uh, I just. It's really funny how things kind of circle around to that. Yeah. After the fact, you know. Yeah. And every so once in a while, uh, you know, I'll be like, oh man, it's Bazon. He he did that thing. It was amazing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was an experience. You know. <sighs> Tell me about it. <laughs> um, so why uh, why the Naval Academy? So when I was a kid, um, I'm the youngest of three brothers. So both older brothers. My oldest brother is ten years older than me. So. As I was, he left the house when I was seven, right? Graduated high school, went on to college. And so as I was about 10, 11 years old, he had just kind of started his naval career and he ended up serving in the Navy for 30 years and seeing like his experience. Now, granted, this was the late eighties, Top Gun had just come out, <laughs> Cold War was ending, like he showed pictures from his deployments and it's like, this is the life. Like, why would anyone not want to go do this? And then when my middle brother started looking at schools, I would go with him. Just He was four years older than me, so my parents would take me on the college visits, and we would go see schools. And my middle brother was smart. like He could have gone full ride to Yale. He had an ROTC scholarship to go there. He chose the Naval Academy, and I remember going on a visit with him and just like – you know, it's like it's like that moment, right? When you walk somewhere, when you're in, in a room, like, or you meet a certain person, you just go like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was for me, my first visit there. Yeah. I remember getting in the car, and my parents even said, like, my mom asked, what'd you think? And I piped up from the back. I'm like, I love it. I'm in. When <laughs> when do I start? She's like, I was talking to your brother. <laughs> like, 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 shut up. Like, you're in the seventh grade. <laughs> is that pretty rare, though, for two brothers to both go to the Naval Academy. Isn't it hard to get in? It's, it's, um, so it's, you know, the academic and, and the physical piece, right? You could imagine, right? You got to pass all the physical. I think probably the most challenging and unique part is getting the congressional nomination. Mm. So, you know, writing to your congressmen or senators and there's other programs where you can even get like vice presidential nominations, but, um, you know, just having to reach out to those folks cause they have allocated spots every year and they, they by can state by state yeah. by their district by each academy so depending how many they've got at west point or navy or air force mm -hmm. then you know that all so that's the the uniqueness of it right like what what makes the application process different from tcu or harvard or stanford is that's probably the most unique piece and every congressman has their own way of doing it some of them you you interview you know, in like South Dakota, you're going to interview with the congressman. Like you're going to yeah. go to his office and probably his or her office and sit there and talk to him. Uh, in New Jersey, there was a panel. So I sat with like six, a couple of them were reserve Navy and then like a couple other grads and they kind of grill you about, yeah, and you're a teenage kid, right? So there's only so much experience, very different than, mm -hmm. you know, later on in life. But, um, you know, and they're just trying to get a sense, is this the type of person that we want out of our district representing us? Hence for a kid though. For, yeah, it, it was... I felt like I just remember like, you know, I was I was a senior, so I just turned eighteen and like I have no experience. Like what what do I know about the world? But Nothing. yeah. And and maybe that's what came across and they liked yeah. it. You know, it's like, oh, you're you're willing to, you know, shut up and listen. Like yeah. <laughs> you'll do great. <laughs> yeah. Just take orders, you'll fit right in. It'll be great. <laughs> yes or no, sir. That's Thank right. You. Yeah, did that and then it was the Marine Corps and and even that, like, as I started to get closer to even selecting as a school, I knew that the Marine Corps was what I wanted to do. I didn't know mm -hmm. what in the Marine Corps, but I knew that that was it. I didn't want to, I didn't want to drive ships. I didn't want to be Maverick. I didn't want to fly airplanes. I didn't want to be a sub. There's only um, one Maverick. Uh, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and it just uh, as you know, went through the process, got my commission, and then as I got closer to that, the more that I got to meet other artillery officers it was like that's that's what i want to do mm. and um you know i've I'll, i've told my kids i uh, tell like friends and family like it it is a nine-year-old boy's dream job i run around the woods and mm. shoot really big guns all day long like hell yeah <laughs> love it hell sign, yeah. Me up. <laughs> sign me up sign me up right even right now you're yeah. like man that sounds pretty awesome <laughs> sitting here rethinking some life choices <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in good shape. I could probably I could do get that. back in there, you know, <laughs> try hard. So, yeah, did that. Again, a couple tours. I ended up 
all said and done, it was three deployments in four years. Um, mm. I had been married. I was married. I'm still married. But um, I just knew, like, at that point, this was now late 04, 05. And I'm like, I, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't know if it was foresight or just looked down the road and went, I, I don't want to miss. This was no longer the, the military that, in my mind, right, this romantic vision of, Hey, I got to do this really cool thing. Mm -hmm. You know, going to combat was was an incredible experience. But it was also, hey, there's this is going to keep happening. This is going to keep going. This was not Desert Storm, right? Mm -hmm. We're not done in forty five days. Like we're this is going to be a lot longer. Um, and again, kind of referencing my brothers, now they were senior in their careers, and I was looking at them and their families, and that same brother, you know, who had the really cool deployments that I remember hearing and seeing pictures and all that had now had to move his family five, six times. Like my nephew was, I think he was six at the time and he lived in four different states. Again, fast forward, he's got friends all over the world, mm -hmm. right? Graduated high school and jumped on a plane and flew to Okinawa to spend a week with his buddies out there, You're right? Like yeah. that's pretty unique, right? Being able to do that. But growing up, like it was always somewhere else. It was a different state. It was moving here. It was dad's gone on deployment and I, I just, I didn't want that. Mm. I didn't want it. So um, my wife was fantastic about it. She was very clear. To this day, she'll even say, like, whatever you do, I knew what I signed up for when when you and I were serious and when we got married. Like, I knew, like, I could be a Marine wife. I get that. If it's not what you want anymore, we'll, we'll figure it out. But mm -hmm. it was never put on me, um, you know, you have to, right? It's me or the core. It was never yeah. that. And she was she's adamant about that. And I think that's probably like one of the things like, you know, when we talk about like, you know, blind spots, like mm -hmm. have those discussions in life beforehand, right? Before before you step into something about, you know, if if and, and you've you've heard it. I know you've had like we've talked about it, like buddies whose wives came to them and were like, I'm out. Yeah. Like I am not doing this anymore. It's been X number of deployments, so you've been gone all these days, and and that's it. And you know that relationship completely falls apart. Like that's one of those things I feel very fortunate about. Is but that's been that's kind of been the practice in our marriage even since. Is that like hey, if we're gonna go try something, right? We talk about it, we figure it out. If there's something we're concerned with, we but ultimately we're gonna support it, right? Yeah. Like and that's you know that's that's a huge thing. That's and what. I, the reason I say that is that it's given me also, it's been having the confidence knowing I've got that support system to go do other things. So I, I got out of the Marine Corps, right? Again, now, like, look on the other side of the coin. I was an artillery guy. All I did was run around and shoot big guns. Like, yeah. what did I have to bring to corporate America? And this was 05. So I had just gotten on LinkedIn. Facebook wasn't really a thing. It was still a couple mm -hmm. years out. Um, it was old school resume writing and, you know, keep it to one page and do this. And it's got to say this, it's got to be in this font with this weight paper to it. Like this was, mm -hmm. this was my transition in doing that. Like that was the realization, like, man, what do I have to bring? What do, what do I have that's valuable that anybody can use? And I was really lucky. I had a, uh, it was an instructor at the Academy who we'd stayed in touch with and, he kind of reached back out and we connected. I kind of told him about what I was thinking and doing. And he had gotten out of the Navy. He actually went to Harvard, got his MBA, then was working for GE, then started his own consulting business. So he went to he Harvard had... instead of TCU? What's wrong with that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Questionable judgment. But... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but he uh he he really helped guide that and like helped me to frame that. So it's something that I've I've taken and I feel pretty passionate about and I, I still get hit up on LinkedIn or from other friends, like, mm -hmm. hey, this guy's getting out. Can you talk to him? Absolutely, right? Like, and help those veterans kind of frame what that looks like and and give them a reality check too, right? I, I was probably like so many other junior military officers to the JMOs, like, oh, I'm going to get out and there's just going to be a line of people waiting to <laughs> write me a job offer. Like, yeah, it doesn't, mm. doesn't happen. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> like, you've got to... It's my first experience of really understanding what sales was. Like I had to, I had to sell myself. I had to yeah. sell who I was and what I brought to the table and what was the value add that I had to someone. So, um, 
all that to say, like, my wife has supported me through all of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do a, the military still does a really bad job of transitioning you over to the civilian sector. Um, I know the Marine Corps, especially, especially in the infantry arm. You know, like, congratulations, you're in great shape and you carried a pack and kept a level head. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck in the civilian sector, which is very cutthroat in its own way. Yeah. I think, I think we're getting better. Mm -hmm. I think there's more avenues. And what do you mean we? Do you mean we? we the I, I think the services as a whole are. Yeah, are no, it's because of people like you and I. Yeah, and that's like. I get hit up twice a week at least. <laughs> okay, let me take a let me take a look at your LinkedIn. All right, here's here's five introductions I I think I'll make for you that you know don't blow it. Yeah, just keep your mouth shut and listen. Didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, no. I, I think, and you also have programs like, you know, there's a hundred of them out there. Hire mm. Our Heroes, Four Block, Veterati, like all of these yeah. are, they, they all have that. Boot campaign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, could, we could probably like, yeah, pull up LinkedIn and we'll, yeah. you can go through a handful of them and it's just find the one that's right for you that makes the most sense and be able to get to it. But mm -hmm. ultimately, those are still things outside of the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, like, it's not their job. Like they don't necessarily want to yeah. set you up for it's not their transitioning. Job. So yeah. it, it's a. Uh, I feel I, I get it. You know, you can kind of yeah. keep both sides of the coin, but yeah, it still sucks when you're sitting across from someone or somebody's about to retire after a 20, 30 year career, and they go, "Gosh, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what I can do. I guess I'm just going to go be a gym teacher." You got out. You got out as a captain. I did. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you've never served in the military, a captain, especially an infantry captain. In the Marine Corps, you have to be a stone cold savage, um, and also you're hurting what can only be described as idiots, right? <laughs> and so, how many Mondays, how many Monday mornings after weekend leave did you come back and someone got married? Someone, <laughs> the, the joke is someone bought a Mustang at twenty six percent interest, right. a ten year old car, and a brand know, new tattoo, and a brand new tattoo that's outside of regulation, by the way. <laughs> did you take that kind of? Savage mentality. I say savage with all compliments for me, because uh, that was the same way. Uh, did you take that attitude into corporate America? Yeah, and there, there's definitely some lessons learned. In that. How'd that work out for you? How'd that work out for you? <laughs> for for all the things that wearing a uniform helps, helps, mm -hmm. you know, creates those traits, right? Like being on time, mm -hmm. you know, showing up early, yeah. to places, um, being detail oriented, you know listening to instructions and following instructions like all of those things will help you and helped me as i started there was also the piece of how do i relate to someone else how mm -hmm. do i how do i understand their experience now i i will say that and i i know you and i have talked about this before like the leader i was in uniform was so different outside because of those lessons i learned wearing the uniform like i i go back so I grew up in New Jersey. It was really insular. Like you, you big Irish, Italian, very Catholic community. Some families had been in that hometown for generations. Like it was very insulated the way that I, I grew up. And I realized it later on. I didn't really realize it. And even at, even at the Naval Academy, we're all high achieving. We were all top two, three percent of our high school classes or you know, like you, you were all high achievers. Everyone was in great shape. They, we all kind of thought the same, right? We all wanted the same things. And then I get in the Marine Corps and you realize like very quickly, mm. not everyone is there because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it, while it's not official <laughs> that the judge will make you enlist, it's enlist or prison, yeah, there were a couple guys who were like, "Hey, here were my options." <laughs> my, my little brother, <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> uh, yeah, <clears throat> I had a, I had a couple of those guys in my uh, in my assault men section. Um, one of them was a kind of a, ended up being kind of a crappy marine. The other guy was amazing. Was that right? Yeah, incredible. And for me, that was my big. That was my aha. Like, mm. oh man, like there are so many other ways to get to this point in life. Mm -hmm. Like I have to be better about opening my eyes to that. I have to be better about being understanding and compassionate to that and what that mm -hmm. looks like. And that was a struggle, right? Like it, why is everyone not like me? Why is everyone not as fired up or as disappointed or as excited about X? 
and really understanding that like I had to connect with people where they were at. That was a really big lesson, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to understand leadership and, hey, Lance Corporal, like, you know, Lance Corporal Schmuckatelli, <laughs> infamous Lance Corporal, right? Yeah. We've all worked with him. Am I going to be the guy that continues to rail on him because everybody else rails on him? Or do I need, can I be better? Can I understand mm -hmm. him? And may, he may never be Marine of the Quarter, but at least let's get him to formation on time. Let's figure out what we need to do to get him here. Um, and that, that was lessons learned, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, falling into those same traps or am I going to try and do something different? Am I going to try and connect to someone and understand them differently? And that helped me as I started to then get into the civilian workforce. There were a lot of those moments of, hey, do I really understand what this person is going through? Mm -hmm. right? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're a rollover, you're a pushover, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. mean, hey, just, oh, you have problems, so I'm just going to back, yeah, it's okay. No, you, it, there's still a level of accountability, but how to approach that and how to explain it to someone, like, hey, here's the expectation, you're not meeting it, or I'm willing to help you, but you've got to help yourself, Mm -hmm. Right, having that hard conversation with someone, um, that those skills came directly out of that experience. Yeah, where did you land? So uh, we, uh, <laughs> when, when I, I don't know, uh, you and I have talked about like you know your experience, but like you know for us, it was either we're gonna go where the job takes us and love where we're at, or we're gonna move somewhere and go figure out a job. We took option B. We loved the Phoenix area. Mm. My wife had some family out there we had gone to visit, and we just, we every time we went, we were like, man, I could see myself here. I love Phoenix. So that was it. We just, we planted our flag in Phoenix and said, we'll, we'll go figure it out. Mm -hmm. And my first job out of the Marine Corps, I worked for Toll Brothers, a big home builder. Home builder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I was an assistant project manager for them, and uh, really just learning construction. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I kind of joke, right, like, I spent the first six years of my career blowing up buildings <laughs> and then the next couple of years trying yeah. to build them, like, yeah. <laughs> like trying to figure this out. And uh, it was a really cool experience. It was, it, it, we were up in North Phoenix. I was working on a, a development out there. I was with them for about a year. Uh, I then had the opportunity to go over to a commercial contractor, so Turner mm -hmm. Construction, big, big commercial contractor based in New York. Um, they did s some big projects out there. And then specifically the jobs, I worked at an Intel facility so a chip making facility out in uh, Chandler, Arizona, and then ended up at the airport for a little while. And mm. Phoenix Sky Harbor was putting in, this was again, you know, 2000, 2006, I started with them, I was with them for about three years. And they were putting in all the baggage handling systems, 100% x-ray systems, like it was all post September 11th money coming in mm -hmm. to all of these entities. So specifically massive grants to, yeah yeah to just go in expand the terminals <clears throat> phoenix as a city was growing so they needed more capacity and then putting in all the baggage handling systems so like i have i've crawled all over those systems you know been under the under the runways and all the tunnels where bags you know mm. will miraculously disappear in your <laughs> travels and okay. kind of understanding all, that whole system did that for it was just just shy of three years and it was in 2009, so 2008, you know, the financial crisis happens, and mm. housing just takes a dump, particularly out in Phoenix. Like, we were one of those markets, mm. super overinflated, and then in 2009, I got let go, so lost my job. So, again, learning experience there, like, what do I do? Was that, did you have any uh, um, forewarning of that, any heads up? Looking back on it, the red flags were all there. I just had to look around. But I was putting my head down and going, well, if I just keep working harder, it won't it won't be me. Yeah, right? it'll be someone else. See, that's that old military mindset. Just outwork the person next to you, just, and, and the cream will rise to the top, and you'll be okay. Right, right. Yeah. At some point, the the division just got small. Right, yeah. like the our office, like people started leaving. You know, every every once in a while, and it's a very morbid humor. I think that a lot of veterans, in particular, get like when you heard the division president he would get on and for whatever reason he would call someone on the office phone but like on speaker so like if you were sitting at your cube on a friday afternoon and you heard boop hey james you know this this is rob i need you to come down to the office real mm. quick everyone knew 
<laughs> everybody knew because every time that you heard that happen, yeah, that person was gone yeah. that day, and uh, then that was my day. Mm. Hey, Bazon, can you come down to the office? Did you have both of your kids at this point? No, I just had one. Okay, um, it was just uh, my daughter. So she was born in 08. Um, it was just after her first birthday. Oh, God. Yeah, it was uh, early October. She was born in September, so early October 2009. Okay. I had made all, all the mistakes that so many people make. I bought, um, I bought a house I couldn't afford. Mm. I, I lived a life and spent money on credit cards and mm. were upside down there. Um, had had no savings. I was I was that statistic, right? Mm -hmm. If the if I had a two hundred dollar emergency emergency, I don't think I would have been able to pay it. I, like mm. I lived that way. I got caught up in we got to buy a house. We got to do this. We got to. We got to. You got to. You got to meet all of the wickets. You got to go hit all the checklists. That's the only way to succeed. That's the only way to go get it there. And losing my job at that point was was the low like that so was so how much money did you have in the bank we had at that point oh less it was thousand bucks maybe oh maybe God. scraped together <laughs> yeah Oof. yeah you know i I, uh, I tell again lesson learned right like i look back and when you get that mortgage pre-approval uh -huh. <laughs> like that's the bank saying, "Hey, we're we're willing to lend you this, you yeah. know, because because yeah, really take a look at that number, yeah, and really understand, like, if I'm doing that, like, what do I have left to eat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, it, and it sounds it sounds oh, foolish, man. right? Like you would you would think that the education I had, the the way that I grew up, you would think." I had my head on straight. Like I would, I would know that, but I got caught up. Mm -hmm. I got caught up in trying to do what everybody else was doing around me and thinking like, well, that, that was the way to do it. So, you know, I lose my job. I had, uh, I was a couple weeks away from actually vesting in my 401k. So mm. half of my 401k. So again, like Poof. even that half was like, from what I did over the first couple of years, like I'm not getting that. It was a, it was a three year vest cycle, and I was short of that, Ugh. so I wasn't getting that. My wife was working at the time. She was, uh, she ran her personal training business, but it wasn't enough. It was, she was doing fine, but it wasn't enough for us to like supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, one child, no money. The low point was having to take physical savings bonds mm -hmm. that my parents had had given me as a child that had not matured yet that I had to walk into you know again as much as that moment of walking in the Naval Academy for the first time has burned in my head this one is too mm -hmm. right I walked into a desert schools credit union in East Mesa Arizona and had to cash in those savings bonds mm. and I remember the young girl behind it her name was Maria and she said these aren't mature yet. And I had to look at her and say, I need money for groceries. Mm. I need money for diapers, like cash those. And, you know, sat out in the parking lot and cried my eyes out for 45 minutes. And, you know, and at that moment it was like, this can never happen again. And mm. all the, all the dark things that come with that, right? You know all all of the experiences that I had gone through, and to say now after all this, I can barely afford to feed my family. Like, I am I am below worthless. Let's talk about that because a lot of people that the organization that we mentioned at the the front of yeah. the program are in life circumstances like that, like that you described, and so very fortunate to be able to help them out and get them through that period. But you didn't have an uh, organization like that to help, so. On paper, naval. What was your degree? I was a political science major. Okay, well, it's terrible, it was a terrible yeah, degree. But I wasn't um, an engineer or anything. <laughs> so, so naval academy alumni, uh, decorated marine captain, 
multiple appointments, proven leadership skills. So on paper, you are an asset to any company that they want to snatch up. But in reality, you were, say, say rock bottom. Yeah. Okay, so you had the pity party, got it all out. What was the next step? Where'd you do? Where'd you go? The uh, I I don't mean to be disrespectful at pity party. I mean no just, no yeah no re- no real man cry I yeah mean, just oh fact, yeah so. and, and it was um yeah it was it was a low point right and and you know to put it bluntly like yeah I thought my life insurance is more than mm. than my life right now and my family would do better without me yeah. like th- those those all came up and um my daughter is fifteen now and I still tell her like she saved my life. Mm. Because I just remember like sitting with her and thinking those things, and then going, "How can this child grow up without her dad? Like, how terrible mm-hmm. would that be?" So it was, it was like, "All right, I got to do something else." So moved on, tried to hit the hit LinkedIn and the job boards and do all those things. Had a job, worked for a roofing company for about a year. It was my first foray into a sales position. Mm. And um, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> door to uh, door? No, it was uh, it was actually so. My role, this company was based up in Ohio. They were a national firm, and they, uh, <laughs> I was in their government sales. So mm. I think they just saw like military. Oh, he can sell to the government. Selling oh, to God. the government is a special, miserable. special ring of hell. Yeah. <laughs> like it is. It's a long sales cycle. It was hard to do. We didn't have defined territories. Like there were all sorts of things. I was miserable. I was on all the road. RFPs. Yeah, uh, RFPs. If you could even get that far, because yeah. depending on who was writing the RFP, it almost kind of directed it to a certain company, which mm-hmm. wasn't us. And it was a traveling position. I was selling nationally, so I was I was on the road all the time. Uh, I put ninety thousand miles on US Airways and I had only been with the company 10 months. Mm. I mean, I was all the time. And September Labor Day um, weekend in 2010, my uh, my wife called me. I, I had flown back to our headquarters in Ohio on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon. And I was supposed to spend the week there. And she called me Sunday night. We were talking, I could tell she was upset. You know, finally got it out. It's like my daughter woke up from her nap and daddy was gone mm-hmm. and she's just been miserable. And, and I'm like, I, again, like this was the whole reason I got out of the Marine Corps. Like I didn't yeah. want to do these types of things. Like I didn't want to miss this. And I went in that week and gave my notice. I'm like, I, I, I can't do this. Still no net, barely making it, but at least enough to pay the bills and, and keep things going. Um, and then in September, 2010, I had a buddy, and this was also my first foray into really understanding networking and the power of my network. Mm-hmm. He was a Naval Academy grad, but a year younger than me. Mm. But we knew each other. He reached out and said, send me your resume. I work for Amazon. We're opening a brand new building in Phoenix. Like, nice. this is Providence right here. Like, I don't have to move. So the first question was like, in my head, like, it's Amazon. They sell books and CDs. How hard could it be? <laughs> I had not been a lot on Amazon. Again, 2010, right? Yeah. We were just kind of just getting warmed up, really discovering what Amazon was all about. And in my interview, I just remembered walking around and going, "Holy crap! These, they sell a lot more than DVDs and books now." Yeah. That's the only reason I ever went to that site. And you started to, to realize it, and that put me on a path. That position opened up doors for me that that were truly life changing. Um, I spent the next six, a little over six years, seven peak seasons with Amazon. So mm. growing in that network and understanding it and e-commerce and all the different facets of, of that organization, uh, that's what moved us here to Texas. So my wife is originally from Oklahoma. I met her in artillery school as I was traveling across the country. And we got we had the opportunity to come to Texas. And it was like we, we jumped on that. And got to grow within that organization and understand it, and kind of I still kind of geek out over it. I've got friends who are in either still with it, with them or with other e-commerce platforms, and just kind of talking to them about, you know, their their bin setups and how their algorithms are working and what their pick paths look like. But after a while, like Amazon, Amazon, we could probably do a whole podcast on Amazon war stories. <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll, we'll book that next. <laughs> <laughs> we could get a handful of guys. You will you will hear some some incredible stories from from that. But 
that's just it was a life at, well I left Amazon and then I went to Chewy.com mm-hmm. so I had the opportunity to continue to progress <clears throat> there not that it was all smooth didn't sailing. they buy Chewy? Amazon no Chewy? Um, Chewy was bought by PetSmart oh uh, okay and in fact l- like what led to that so I'll back up a second like my time at Amazon, while it was great, was also not all smooth sailing. Um, there were definitely moments where things didn't go right. And I really started to understand at that point, like, how I, how I operate or how I react to things mm-hmm. is going to drive the environment that I'm in. Mm-hmm. And specifically, like, when I was at Amazon at one year, I just had a really rough year. And... Long story short, I got promoted probably a year, year and a half, maybe even two years earlier than I should have Mm -hmm. and got put into a role. I thought I was ready for it. My leadership team thought I was ready for it. I was not ready for it. And it was a it was a terrible year. And I was fortunate at the end of that year that I had a, a general manager, a leader who said, you know, she in particular said, like, I still believe in you. And one of the things that probably saved my job um, was I went one day and I just sat down and said, look, I'm struggling. Like, I, I don't, I'm struggling with this, this, this. Here's where I'm, I'm not hitting the mark. I know it. I don't need anybody in this office to tell me that I'm not there. All I'm asking for is help me get to mm-hmm. where I need to go. And she gave me, she's like, all right, here, here's your path. Here, here are the two, three things. And I think I look back on that moment and I compare it to that young lieutenant who was the pound the fist on the table. I'll just outwork someone. I'll just work harder. I'll just mm-hmm. yell louder. And it was, it was a turning point in that I understood truly being humble, saying I can't do this alone or I need help and recognizing that in myself opened up a door that allowed me to continue to grow because I would I if I'd have if I'd have fought it I would have lost my job what ended up happening was I actually got demoted Mm -hmm. you know sounds like the best outcome though it absolutely was because it gave me a chance to step back to a role that was I don't I won't say beneath but more on level with where I where I was and take that role to grow it and be a bigger influence. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to continue working there. I enjoyed the the company. I enjoyed the people. I enjoyed the team. I enjoyed the environment. I just, this role wasn't right at the time. So taking a step back, um, there's a little bit of shame, right? Nobody wants to, nobody wants to admit it. Like most big corporations, right? Someone can pull up your profile and it's like, hey, it says this. You know, mm-hmm. in, in my case, it says level six. I, I thought you were a level seven manager. And I would just, yeah, don't worry about it, right? Can, like I would, can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So you said how you react to um, situations that controls your environment. Is that what you said? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, when I got that notice, I sat down with GM and she explained it. She said, look, like you were just not ready for this. I see value. We see value. The leadership team still sees value this is the best option again right the the pride comes up like i'm not gonna take it to most like screw you right i know who i am Mm -hmm. but the outcome to that is all right then here's your your job here's your yeah you're you're done like we you're not gonna stay in this role i came back and talked to i I walked outside i sat in my car kind of stewing on it i came back in i wanted to vent a little bit she let me and then she said just take tomorrow off don't come in tomorrow just take the day off just process everything and I remember going home that night I didn't want to tell my wife right again shame Mm -hmm. there's that pride that says like no I like I'm the man of the house like I don't get I don't I don't get beat down like this and then we went out the next day and we sat down and talked through it and it's like as I was talking it's like what what am I so upset about right I Mm -hmm. still get to be I still get good pay I still get to be in an environment around people that I like being around. I still get to do this job. Like, what am I really, oh, my title changed. Ego. So it, it was exactly like, this is just me. Mm-hmm. This is just the way that I look at it. This is the way that I'm processing this. I can take this kick 
and turn it into something good. How old, how old was your daughter? This was in 2014. So she was, five. yeah, she, she six. was uh, six. And we had had my son then too. Okay. So she was six and he was two. So yeah. Maybe that, still a little too young to learn a lesson from what you're dealing with. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they they wouldn't have captured it at the time, but to your point, right? Like this has now kind of driven a lot of things as as I move forward as a parent, right? Like, mm-hmm. hey, this thing that's happening to you, like you get to choose how you react to this. It sucks. I'm not saying don't mm-hmm. get hurt, don't don't feel bad, don't feel upset, but you know, you get to choose how you react to it. Yeah. And that was really the probably the biggest lesson out of that is and you know, this whole podcast was started to learn about other people's mistakes and what we can learn from. I think if God, I can list off a hundred business people and people that we would probably know that if they could conquer their ego or just set that aside, you know, they yeah. would be in so much of a, a better position in life and in their career, you know, and, and for men, especially it controls a well, one, the man of the household, I should be an earner or, you know, when you come to a veteran who did some pretty incredible things in the, in the military and th- they think they're too good to do a certain type of job or yeah. work their way up. And we see it all the time, all the time. I was trying to help this uh, lieutenant colonel. I was trying to mentor him along, help him figure out what to do after B school. Um, and he would just kick down a lot of jobs just because the money wasn't right or the title wasn't right or the, you know, yeah. just get out of your way, man, just for a little bit. I- I can't remember. I think it was a podcast or something I had heard, and this has always stuck with me. And it's the example I, I, I tell someone now. If you have an infantry battalion, mm-hmm. so that let's use this this lieutenant colonel as an example, right? So he's the head of an infantry battalion, three hundred fifty mm-hmm. people, four hundred marines. They've got assets. They've they've got a job to do. That ego would tell you, you know upper management, maybe even C-suite, right? CEO level, right? You can, I can run a 400 person operation. Well, let's turn the table. Would you take a senior middle manager at a fortune 500 company, pluck him out of it at fill in the blank, GE, Walmart, Target, Mm. right? Would you take that senior level manager and say, well, you're pretty much equal to an infantry battalion commander. Go ahead. You can you can take that role. Go Good ahead. Good luck, buddy. We would never do that. <laughs> no. We would never, do, never that. do that. But yet there's this mentality that like, well, you know, I, I did this, so I should be at that level. And it's like, Mm-mm. you haven't done it. You haven't done the job. Yeah. Would, would you take one of your Lance Corporals and go, well, yeah, you can run the battalion now. Go ahead. No, you would never do yeah. that. He has yeah. no experience. You, there's a certain amount of expertise. Like you got to understand the system. You got to know who to ask to pull financials. Mm-hmm. Like you have none of that experience. Like take a take that humble pie. Take that little that bite of humble pie and a little bit of humility. And yeah, maybe go down a level. Mm. It'll it'll help in the long run. And that's if if I would have known that 15 years ago, my experiences would have been different right you know? instead, of, <laughs> instead of having to learn that you know honestly really over the last few years uh to kind of put that to the side yeah you know things uh, things would be a lot different when i try to mentor um doesn't matter who they are when i try to mentor them that's the first thing like hey actually you don't really matter that much so i gotta be honest like you're matter to your family but you're not that big of a deal right you're just when it comes to working in corporate america you're just a cog in a wheel you can be that cog better than anything. Maybe you'll get to be a bigger cog sure, one day. Sure. But um, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I think it's just the realization that like you can control what you can control. Mm-hmm. Right. So whatever that environment is, right, whether it's this job or it's, you know, if I'm going to dig a ditch, it's got to be a good ditch. Mm-hmm. Right. And it sucks and it, my back hurts and all these other things. But if this is my job, I should be able to go execute it and I should be able to do it better than, than someone else. And kind of that, I just go back to the humble pot. Like if you just, if you can take a little bite of humility and understand somebody else's role, like mm-hmm. that is eye opening. And it, it changed my career, right? Like change when going through that experience and kind of taking a step back and saying, okay, I wasn't ready for this yet. I'm ge- I'm being a given a second chance. Mm-hmm. Let me let me go prove it. Like most 
companies, you know, there's performance reviews. So my performance review that year, no, no surprise. In that level of managers, I was at the bottom. Okay? Mm. No, no surprise there. I, w- I was not surprised. The next year, it was like, okay, well, if I'm going to be this level six manager, I'm going to be best damn level six manager. Like, watch out. Yeah. Right? And sure enough, a year later, like, top tier, ready to promote, ready to do these things. And, you know, it, it was having that opportunity to just take a step back and go, I, can, I needed a reset. I needed mm-hmm. to... The, the the word I heard uh, a buddy of mine use was you just needed to marinate a little while. Mm-hmm. You just needed to sit back and marinate a little bit longer, and then boom, you were ready. And that's what it, and that's exactly what it was. So like conversations with vets, conversations with colleagues, like don't be in such a rush to get to the next level. There is this mindset with people in general, right? I got to get the next wicket. I got to get to the next level. I got to move from A to B. I got to I got to achieve. I got to go faster and harder. And we can again, we could probably spend a whole mm-hmm. <laughs> podcast yeah. on social media and and, yeah. and what that's doing to for, for that mentality, right? Like, oh, you know, it's a quick fix. You just got to move. You got to keep going. Like and I won't even blame social media. Like started at school, right? At the at the academy. From day one, you're counting down the days till something. Mm -hmm. You're either counting down the days till the end of plebe summer. You're counting down the days till graduation. You're counting down the days till Christmas break. And literally, like, as a plebe, the freshman there, like, you had to know the day count. Mm. Oh, it's 35 days till this. Like, it was, you know, all the silly little things that military schools make you do, right? Yeah. Like, so there was this mentality, even starting then, that, like, well, I got to count down to something. I got to... I got count down with TBS, and then I get to artillery school. Then at artillery school is my first unit. Then my first deployment. Then I got to go be the XO. Then I got to do. I got to do. I got to do. I got to do. And you start. I did. I started to get into this trap of like I've just got to keep moving. I got to keep achieving. I got to keep hitting the checklist mm-hmm. versus on to the next. Taking a break yeah. and just looking around for a minute, going, "Am I ready mm-hmm. for this? Is this where I'm supposed to go?" And you know, Marine Corps and the military they have their own methodology, and it's worked for a couple hundred years. So. God bless it. But as an individual, like this is these were the big ahas. These are these were the big notices for me. Like, man, I just I've I, there's more. I've got to take take a minute and figure this piece out. And that's really what started to drive into a lot of that just personal growth around understanding who I am. Am I mastering something or am I just checking a box? Mm-hmm. Am I and and do I need to master it? Right, that's the other piece is also understanding there's people on a team or there's people in my role or other people that I can rely on that know that better than I do. Yeah. So well that mindset's real helpful um also for BJJ, you know. Absolutely. Um, cuz if you're just obsessed with the ne- next stripe or the next belt, you know, it gets real old real quick. That's just cuz you're a sandbagger and you don't yeah. like to get promoted. Yeah. yeah. 10 I years to get promoted, I refuse <laughs> to get promoted. <laughs> Uh, thank you for calling me out on my own shit. Absolutely, That's, somebody has to. Great. So <laughs> we're gonna strike that from the record. Um, okay. So, so what was the next step? So, what, what what happened with Amazon? Yeah, finished up with Amazon, then had the opportunity to go over to Chewy.com. So I mentioned that, and mm-hmm. I went over there as the assistant GM and then the GM. So I ran that building for a little over a year down in Grand Prairie, still in the e-commerce world, right? Growing, growing that. I went through the acquisition when PetSmart bought Chewy. So had an opportunity to kind of see what that looked like and and go through that process. And then this was uh, probably fall of 2018. And uh, no, 2017, excuse me. My wife had a relatively major surgery. Kids were getting older. And I kind of, again, had that, I had that self-assessment moment. I went, all right, they're getting older. I haven't been on the inside of a gym in any form or fashion in years. Mm. I'm probably about 20 pounds heavier. Like I knew my life wasn't going the way that I I wanted to. I wasn't, I couldn't go be a coach. And Mm. my son at the time was just about to turn five. So he was just going to start T-ball and kind of getting into things. And my daughter was already in cheer and doing all this. And yeah, I'll show up for the events, but like, I'm not running them to practice. I don't know any of the coaches. I don't know these other people. Like, I was providing, but I wasn't present. Mm-hmm. And uh, my wife, even again, this you know, 
we've been married uh, just over 20 years now and she has these she has these nuggets where it's like she just it, what a great reality check where you know she sat me down it's like you're gonna kill yourself mm. you are going to work yourself to death and you know for what we've got it yeah for what like we'll, we'll figure it out we've always we've figured it out you know mm-hmm. favorite phrase that I have we'll figure it out we'll, like you know we'll, we'll we'll see where this takes us and uh, she had talked to me and, you know, I'd always talked about becoming an advisor. I had always said that I wanted to be a financial advisor. I had a financial advisor um, who, who gave some good advice around it and said, hey, go get prof- – I wanted to do it when I first got out of the Marine Corps. And he pulled me aside and was like, listen, one, you haven't saved enough money, <laughs> which, as I've already expressed, a couple yeah. years down the road came to absolute fruition. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other thing he said was, hey, you, you know, your job experience so far was shooting big guns and chasing bad people. Go do something else. Really hard to go sit with somebody and talk to them about their business or their life savings or their family's wealth and mm-hmm. be able to have a meaningful discussion when you haven't done any of those things. Mm-hmm. So that's really what kind of started me on that path to, to these other things. So um, it was time. It was, you know what? We've, we've financially, we got ourselves in a much better place. We had turned, turned the ship 180 degrees. We had said, like, let's, let's go do it. You know, and it was, uh, so 2018, I left the e-commerce world. Um, I left all the challenges with that and decided to go get my licenses and started as a financial advisor and um, started with nothing, started with zero, a book of zero and just have continued to grow. And all of those life lessons, now I feel at least, you know, if I can pat myself on the back, right, have made me more effective when I'm sitting down with someone. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in that, over the last couple of years, you know, going through all the challenges of COVID and what that looked like as a parent, mm-hmm. what that is, uh, losing both my parents in my dad passed away in 2020, my mom in 21 through health issues and having to put my mom in a assisted living for a little while and moving them here out of Florida. Like, like these were all examples and like these little moments that I can now sit in front of somebody, you know, when, you lost your job? Yeah, I know what that feels like. I know where you're at. Yeah. Right? Hey, let me go buy you dinner tonight because I don't want you stressing about it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Let me go do that. Right? Let me, uh, oh, you know, you, you, you're you going to have to sell your house because, you know, you can't afford the payment. Yeah, I've, I've been there. Like, mm. here's, here's, a, here's a way to do it. Here are the terms that you're looking for. Here's how, here are the people that you want to go talk to. Mm-hmm. Here's how you explain it the next job that you go because it's going to show up on your credit report. Right? Like, those experiences. I had to go through to be able to be more effective in doing that. Mm-hmm. And then as that job continued to progress, I had the opportunity I met who are now my, my partners. So Kyle and Bruce and Kyle and I started to do some work with some clients. We really liked each other. And it, as that grew, I got to know Bruce and it's the more that we work together. It's like, this was, this was the, the team that I was looking for. Right. Again, mm-hmm. that self-assessment learning to do this job and learning all the widgets and learning all the expertise and what are the things and the terms I could go do all that. Yeah. But man, there's some, there is some stuff that I just hate doing. Mm -hmm. I don't like doing analysis on certain things, right? Not my jam. Mm -mm. But Kyle loves it, right? Give Kyle a spreadsheet and he's happy. Like get out of his way. Like that's, that's his world. Yeah. That's (laughs) his world. Like, Kyle would never be in this room, yeah. right? He's like, no, no, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> like, you go do that. <laughs> like, understanding myself well enough to go, this is what I'm strong at. This is what I'm good at. If mm. I can leverage someone else to do this other piece, man, we can we can accomplish so much more. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not a, a career that I could ever do, um, but I, I love the fact that I just picture you keeping – young people or older people from ever having to sit in that car and having their personal rock bottom yeah. when it comes to financials. And sometimes it's inevitable. I, I admire it. Well, look, man, thank you for coming on. Thank you for kind of talking about your personal struggles and your, and your growth. Um, you've got a great career and a great reputation. You've got a, uh, a heart for service that I admire and respect. And um, I want to ask you uh, the same question I ask everybody. If someone's listening to this podcast and trying to figure things out or trying to learn from your experiences, give us one thing, one thing to take with them. Can I, can I make it two? <laughs> can I give you two? <laughs> you, yeah, you can give as many answers as you want. Uh, the, the, the first one is get outside your bubble. 
I, I tell my kids this a lot. I want them to go travel. I want them to go see other places. I want to go see other, the way other people live. Go get out of your bubble. Be, be willing enough to go see how someone, you may not agree with them, but be open and compassionate enough to go see it and go experience it and go understand it and see and take the goods and the bads from it. Um, and you don't have to go far, mm-hmm. right? Like even in this area of Fort Worth and, and North Fort Worth where, where we live, like there's still, there's still some people who are in rough places, mm-hmm. right? And rough lives, like go, go experience that, go understand it. For me, and I think what most people would gain from that is you'll get a better understanding. Here's, here's an example. Growing up in my hometown, I can remember one kid in school whose parents were divorced, and it was almost like nobody talked about it. That is not the case for most, Correct. unfortunately, yeah. right? We, th- that concept of broken marriages and broken homes like, and blended families, I didn't have a great concept of that. How mm-hmm. strange does that say to, as an adult now? But like, I didn't. So what are the challenges with that, right? As a father, when you're trying to raise somebody else's kid or your kid is being raised by someone else, Mm-hmm. And understanding that, like that's that's that type of understanding. Again, you don't have to go far. The other one is marinate. Don't be afraid to take something and just soak it in for a little while. Really understand it. Don't be in such a rush to bigger, batter, better immediately. Like give yourself the opportunity to really soak that in. Um, I know, you know. My example at Amazon, right? Like that that's probably the one that I would harken back to. Is that mm-hmm. if I didn't if I didn't take that opportunity to just take a step back and figure this out, like who knows where my life would have been, right? I, I would mm-hmm. have continued to chase the bigger, better, badder. Like take that moment. Like don't be afraid to let things just marinate just for a little bit. Um you know, and that's it's hard to do. It's hard to do when you compare yeah. to everybody else around you. Like you might take the extra six months or the extra year, but man, if you can, if those extra six months make you a hundred times better. Yeah. I love it. It's not a terrible thing. No. So. That's awesome, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on and kind of talking Thank about your you. experiences. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it takes a lot to admit that you made some mistakes and it takes a lot to, to uh, be humble. And I, I admire that, and I thank you very much. For more information on the show and uh, Mr. Bazon Morris, you can go to our show notes. All our links will be there. You can download this episode, like, and subscribe on all the major platforms, Spotify, Apple, all the good stuff. I appreciate you. Thank appreciate you, man.